But today, our guest is Thomas Dean. He is a senior presidential writer and editor at the University of Iowa. He got his PhD from the University of Iowa, uh, where he also teaches interdisciplinary courses. He has taught writing, literature, and interdisciplinary subjects at Cardinal Stritch College in Milwaukee, Michigan State University, and Moorhead State University in Minnesota. Uh, he currently serves on the board of directors of Humanities Iowa. Dean has published essays in regional and national publications. His books include a book about uh, Paul Grucco, the writer Paul Grucco, called The Grace of Grass and Water, and um, uh, a memoir called Under a Midland Sky, and um, his most recent book with uh, Cindy Crosby is a collection of essays and photographs um, about which he's going to talk today. And as you can see, there are beautiful books up here that he can sign for us. So, yeah. All right. So, uh, welcome, Thomas, and uh, thank you for coming. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you for uh, coming out on this very cold day. Um, and Stacy and I were doing a lot of emailing about whether it was going to work out with the snow and the storm and roads, but everything was fine coming up. And uh, my family and I spend um, some time almost every summer up in northern Minnesota near the Boundary Waters near, near Ely, and I'm always kind of looking at um, what's going on up there. And I checked this morning, and the air temperature in Ely was minus 25. <laughs> so. So as they say in Minnesota, it could be worse. <laughs> so didn't complain too much today. So um, just a couple of thank yous on my part again. Thank you to the Tallgrass Prairie Center, uh, both for uh, sponsoring this talk and inviting me and, and having me here, as well as for helping support the book itself, which I'll talk about uh, how that worked in, in, in a minute. Um, I thank our publisher, Steve Semkin uh, of Ice Cube Press for publishing the book and working with Cindy and I and um, uh, being willing to do this. A bit, a bit of an unusual book. Uh, Steve and the Ice Cube Press are in North Liberty, uh, right in the Iowa City area. Of course, I thank my co-author, um, Cindy Crosby. And um, uh, also, I want to mention uh, who our, our unsung hero is, is uh, very talented woman named Cindy Keipel, who is our designer uh, for the book. And this book wouldn't be what it is without, without her. For both Cindy uh, and I, and I think Steve, this turned out visually and, and uh, materially m much greater than anything we had imagined. So we're really grateful for, uh, for her, her tremendous work uh, on, on this book. Um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about how the book came together and some of the ideas behind it as well as do some reading and sharing some of the photographs uh, in here with you. Um, and uh, uh, I think I'll just start out actually with a, um, by reading the, the first essay in the book. The essays are all very short and uh, there's a few poems in there uh, as well but for the most part they are uh, they are essays and um, make sure technology is still working and this is the first essay in the book <clears throat> uh, and it's called path the path to prairie is patience it cannot be apprehended in a panoramic view in close study of each plant or animal, or in a single encounter. The path to prairie takes a lifetime to traverse. To enter prairie is a lifelong commitment. The path to prairie is awe. Without accepting awe, madness may ensue. Legend has it that some European pioneers went insane in the vastness of the sea of grass. Did they fail to revere a horizontal immensity? The path to prairie is humility, sibling to awe. Within the prairie's vast beauty and mystery, we must accept our smallness, set aside our arrogant dominion. Know that even in the presence of the least petal and the slimmest grass blade, we are but humble guests of the grassland. The path to prairie is understanding the unseen. 
We celebrate the beauty of wildflowers, the majesty of grasses, the fleeting beauty of birds and insects, the stateliness of bison and elk, but we must know most prairie is concealed underground. The essence of prairie, the life-giving force, is the deep roots that hold soil, deliver water, and feed the subterranean biome. We cannot view prairie's dark beauty and animating energy. If we dig to do so, we destroy them. The path to prairie is centeredness. We must fix our minds and bodies within ourselves, cast off distractions and artifice, or we will fail to perceive, sense, and comprehend the minuteness and the totality of prairie. Missing that, we miss the spirit, the genius loci, perhaps the soul of the tall grass. The path to prairie is openness. In centering ourselves, we activate the full spectrum of perception, opening our sight, hearing, smell, and touch to the vast variety of life abounding about us. When we are open, we can shift our discernment gracefully from the delicate wind flower to the broad expanse of blue stem. When our senses are fully open, we are prepared to receive the earth story the prairie can share with us, a story that leads us to ever greater gifts. The earth story is a path we can never complete. The path to prairie is endless. The path to prairie is timeless. Uh, this photo is from uh, Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge, you may recognize it, and the previous one was uh, from the Hoover uh, Prairie, the uh, Hoover National Historic Site in West Branch near Iowa City where the uh, Presidential Museum and Library are, and they've got a wonderful 70 to 100 acre prairie restoration there, and a lot of the photos in, their, in the book are, are from there, uh, both because it was close to home for me, but also uh, because it's, it's really nice, and I really, I really love going there. Um, uh, just another sub-note, um, Laura had mentioned Paul Grucco, uh, and that is a writer that I've always admired and uh, loved his writing. And, uh, and was fortunate to get to know. He passed away in 2004. Uh, and uh, this essay, Path, actually is, is in some ways, I don't mention this in the book, but it's, but it's a bit of an homage to, to Paul Grucco. You may be familiar with his uh, short essay, What the Prairie Teaches Us. And I kind of modeled a, a bit of the structure of, of, this, uh, of this essay on that, that essay uh, as well. Um, just to talk a little bit about uh, the book and how, how it came together, this is my uh, co-author and co-photographer, Cindy Crosby. Uh, she is a writer uh, and naturalist from Illinois. Illinois is my home state, actually, as, as it uh, turns out. And uh, uh, she came out 2017, I believe. Uh, wonderful little book, if you're not familiar with this, The Tall Grass Prairie and Introduction. Uh, and it's from Northwestern University Press. And uh, she also, Cindy, does a, a wonderful blog, Tuesdays in the Tall Grass. And she posts something uh, like clockwork every Tuesday, uh, some wonderful writing and, and photographs. Uh, and uh, in fact, that's one of the first places that I got to know Cindy. Um, just a couple of other quick things on uh, my background, as Laura mentioned, um, these are a couple of books that I've done, uh, a book in honor of Paul Grucco, The Grace of Grass and Water, and then uh, Under a Midland Sky, which is a, a collection of personal essays on uh, living in the Midwest, living in the Middle Lands, and kind of a thematic emphasis on the sky and things that are in the sky and things that happen in the sky and weather and so forth. Both of those are from Ice Cube Press as well uh, as, uh, as this book is. Um, Cindy and I kind of came together through this book, The Tall Grass Prairie Reader, John Price, uh, who is the head of the creative writing program at the University of Nebraska Omaha, a graduate of the University of Iowa and an Iowa native. Um, both Cindy and I had essays in this book. This is a great book. It's, it's historical uh, as well as contemporary. Uh, it has uh, essays on the prairie from about as early as you could find essays on the prairie up to contemporary writers. 
And both Cindy and I have essays in there. And what happened was that Cindy went through uh, and found all of the living writers in the book and, and contacted them and basically said, hi, I'm in the book too, um, you know, just, just touching base. And, uh, and, and she sent me a Facebook message, uh, as it turned out. So Facebook does some good things. Um, and we kind of struck up some conversations and uh, a bit of an online friendship. And then when um, Cindy's book, uh, The uh, Tallgrass Prairie, an introduction came out, she asked if I'd write a blurb for it, which I was very happy to do. And uh, Tuesdays in the Tallgrass, her blog I mentioned, as I said, has, has a lot of wonderful photographs. And I've become interested in photography as well. And neither Cindy nor I claim to be professional photographers, but we have an interest and I admired both her writing and her photography. Uh, so I suggested we should, should maybe do, do something together, do, do a book together uh, of some sort. And she was, she was open to that. So that, that's kind of how this, um, this came about. Um, let me talk a little bit about how the uh, book, what the book is about in some ways. Uh, let me read a bit from the uh, introduction here, which is uh, somewhat explanatory. And uh, this, both Cindy and I did introductions. This is, um, this is mine. Uh, this photo is uh, from Hickory Hill Park in uh, Iowa City. This is the, uh, one of the prairie areas in Hickory Hill. Uh, it's August, I think. Um, so, here's just a little bit from the introduction. We are always embedded in the land we dwell upon. In practical terms, our physical bodies are dependent on a functioning ecosystem. So our inescapable obligation of environmental care is to our own benefit, as well as that of the health, well-being, and integrity of the living earth. But when we are truly home in the world, the other aspects of our beings, spiritual, aesthetic, emotional, are also inextricably entwined with nature. For those of us in much of the continent's middle land, our natural home is the tall grass prairie. As I mentioned in one essay in this collection, despite a life lived entirely in the Midwest, my awareness of and love for the prairie came only in adulthood. I don't recall one mention of blue stem or spiderwort in all of my schooling. As an Iowan transplanted from Illinois, I live and have lived in arguably the most altered land in the world. As a child, my understanding of prairie, if the word was invoked at all, meant something more abstract, such as flat Midwest that you plant corn on. Obviously, prairie doesn't mean that at all. And while I have learned much as an adult about the native grasses, forbs, animals, waters, and soil of the land I live on, I have also come to understand how much prairie is part of who I am, my identity, my spirit, my aesthetic sense, my emotions, and much more. Cultivating a land ethic, as Aldo Leopold would call it, to care for that land clearly involves communicating with others. Drawing out our understandings of self and culture does as well. The arts of conversation, then, are essential to building a vibrant relationship, not only with other people, but with the place that is our home. To be in search of the prairie spirit here in this place on earth means to engage in tall grass conversations. When I asked Cindy Crosby if she would like to collaborate on a book about the prairie, we were in the midst of a conversation, appropriately enough, in exchange about her previous prairie book. Conversation has always been at the heart of this book's concept and origin, even before we settled on tall grass conversations as a title. If we think of it broadly as an exchange that brings two or more entities together and dynamically creates something new, Conversation is perhaps our greatest hope, not only for healing the rifts in human understanding, but also for restoring and re-inspiring our relationship with the natural world that is our home. In this book, conversation works on multiple levels. I have admired Cindy's words and photos in her Tuesdays in the Tallgrass blog, and I have had a burgeoning interest in photography in addition to my work as a writer, so I suggested we publish a book that brings our individual prairie voices and prairie eyes together. 
Cindy and I have different backgrounds, different writing voices, and different photographic perspectives. Yet we both bring them to bear on our love and advocacy for the tall grass prairie. We thought bringing together these differences, rooted in common ground, could yield yet more new understandings of the prairie and inspire others to enter tall grass conversations of their own. On individual levels, our own writings and photographs converse symbiotically in this book with the hope that bringing two expressive forms together, photography and writing, will create an artistic whole greater than the sum of their parts. But more importantly, Cindy and I intended to converse with each other, to have our words and images play off one another. Our ultimate aspiration is that we inspire you, our readers, to understand and enrich your experience of the prairie in ways you haven't before. Whether you are a naturalist, conservationist, writer, artist, activist, environmentalist, outdoor enthusiast, however you define yourself in relation to the prairie. We also hope that you will be inspired to engage in your own tall grass conversations, bringing your personal multiple expressive forms together and then maybe exchanging them with others. In so doing, we hope you will not only see the prairie anew, but also stretch your artistic talents, which need not require years and years of training or a fortune in equipment. Both my and Cindy's cameras are relatively simple. Prairie is among the most altered and threatened ecosystems in the world. At the same time, our natural world is our first and most profound home. Care of the world is always essential and care arises from conversation. We invite you to join us on this journey of care and inspiration through your own tall grass conversations. So again, we're interested in entering into conversations with, uh, with others as well through the book. Uh, I wanna just share a couple of quotations uh, from a couple of writers um, that have uh, reflected some of the thinking that I've done and have inspired me a little bit. Um, these are not writers uh, of the prairie particularly, but writers about connecting with the, with the uh, natural world. The first is from a book came out last year uh, by Andres Edwards called Renewal, How Nature Awakens Our Creativity, Compassion, and Joy. We experience our external interdependence with the natural world through our land stewardship practices that can either enhance or degrade the health of non-human species. Our internal interdependence happens more subtly through our emotional connection to nature, our empathy for other species, and our appreciation for the beauty and mystery of life. So that's kind of what we're trying to do in the book too, is we're trying to tap into both of those elements of our, our what Andres Edwards calls our external interdependence, you know, what we do on the prairie and with the prairie, and whether it's hiking or um, uh, conservation or uh, you know whatever work or, or physical um, activity we may be doing with the prairie as well as the internal independence again our emotions our expressions uh, thinking about ways to artistically express or other ways to express our relationship with the prairie um, following up a little bit from the same book uh, Andres Edwards the psychologists Dr. Keltner and Jonathan Haidt have discovered that awe has two distinct qualities perceived vastness, the feeling of something greater than ourselves, and accommodation, the need to integrate the sense of something vast into our being. And even in the uh, uh, PATH essay, I invoke this idea of awe, and I think and I hope that that is an experience that people have going into the prairie or any natural landscape, just you know, being awestruck by it. Uh, but as, as uh, Andres Edwards says, then we have to do something with it. And he says it could be, it could happen in many different ways. It could be spiritual, some kind of spiritual reaction. It could be, um, uh, again, some kind of activist uh, reaction, action that you take. It could be some conservationist. Uh, and this is the, comes under this heading of accommodation to integrate that sense of awe into something, into ourselves. And I think expression is for us what we're trying to do in this book. Well, we are, uh, experience the awe of the prairie and we're trying to express it in word and image. Uh, similar idea, both um, Cindy and I are very enamored of the poet Mary Oliver, whom we lost last year, just a little over a year ago. 
Now, this is a, a well-known uh, quotation from one of her poems. In some ways, it says a similar thing to what Andres Edwards is saying. Instructions for living a life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. And I think both Cindy and I try to you know, have, have that as a philosophy of life in some ways. Uh, one more uh, bit of quotation. Belden Lane is a writer. He's actually a religious studies scholar, retired uh, from St. Louis. And uh, even though I myself am not religious uh, <coughs> uh, uh, much of any sort, I, I've enjoyed his work quite a bit. Uh, this book just came out last year, The Great Conversation, Nature and the Care of the Soul. And he actually did a, a retreat at Prairie Woods Echo Spirituality Center in Hiawatha uh, near Cedar Rapids that both Cindy and I attended uh, about two years ago uh, now. And that retreat was before this book came out and it was based in large part upon, uh, upon his, uh, uh, his, his work in, in this book. Um, and even though we had, you know, our book was pretty well getting to, to the end, I think uh, Belden Lane's thoughts and ideas about conversation and conversation with nature still informed uh, what we were doing quite a bit. Uh, a couple of quotations. What, what he's talking about is a little bit complex and it's hard to capture in just a sentence or two from quotations, but um, a couple sentences from Belden Lane in, in this book. We're surrounded by a world that talks, but we don't listen. We're part of a community engaged in a vast conversation, but we deny our role in it. Uh, to enter the great conversation is to bring to consciousness the relationship that already exists between the parts and the whole. So much of what he's talking about is our is the holistic relationships, of course, that we are part of nature, we are part of the natural world, and we have to become conscious of what role we play in that. Uh, to be is to be related. Hence, the more I give myself with attentiveness to any other being, the deeper the relationship grows. And I think that's the central idea of the, his idea of conversation is this attentiveness. Pay attention, as Mary Oliver says, uh, and then, then be struck, understand what, uh, be awestruck, but also understand what our relationship is uh, with, with um, that world outside of us. Uh, the play of imagination and reverie operating through the senses is how we connect. And this is where he talks about what does it mean to be in conversation with nature. A lot of his book centers around this relationship Belden Lane has with a tree, a very old hundred year old cotton tree in a park across the street from his home. And he spends every night going out and visiting this tree. Uh, and he's developed this relationship with the tree you know, over the years. And, and in this part where I'm quoting from, he talks about where you know, he, he tries to experience this tree in a, um, you know, through the senses, through touch and smell and sight and hearing everything else, uh, and then uh, you know, letting uh, whatever thoughts or feelings uh, emerge from that. So that is part, much of what the conversation is all about, the play of imagination and reverie operating through the senses. That's how we connect. It's about communication that turns into communion where once you saw disconnected parts, you now find an organism. All right, I'm gonna um, read a, a few essays here uh, from the book. And um, this first one is called Surprise. And in some ways, th this essay uh, follows a bit on what Belden Lane is talking about in terms of that, um, I, I, I gotta make sure I get the words right. Uh, of course, I always get sensuous and sensual mixed up. <laughs> Um, sensu, sensuous is, uh, is, is uh, connecting to, to the senses. Is that what David Abrams' book <coughs> spelled with the sensuous? So how do we connect um, through the senses? And then what do we do with that? This is, um, <clears throat> this photo is from uh, the Hoover Prayer again. Surprise. On a winter day on the prairie, I lie down amidst the dry, dormant stems of tall grass. Which is what I did to get this photo. I literally lay down uh, and looked up, which is something we don't often do. So it's this idea of let's look at this differently. Let's experience this differently. Not an activity I suspect that would jump to mind for most on a cold February day in Iowa. 
but new perspective requires bold, well, unusual action. As my back crunches down on the crisp litter fall, my eyes gaze upward. Above me play the light brown lines and curves of sleeping blue stem, in relief against the gorgeous high pressure blue sky. The playful twists and curves flutter just slightly in the breeze, dry remnant streamers of the prairie's flags of summer. But in this quiet time, I delight in surprise. The thin ribbons above me look more like party decorations than nature at rest. I see the prairie at play, not asleep. It's not what I expected. I feel I am fully in the prairie in its joyful round of life, not just on the prairie in a time of death. When I visit the prairie, I always try to put expectations aside. Prairie comforts me when I enter its familiarity, but it brings me even greater gifts when I let it surprise me. Sometimes that means looking closer. Sometimes that means uh, listening more intently, both to the song of the prairie itself and the song it raises within me. Sometimes that means putting my whole body among the grasses and forbs in ways I've never experienced before. I might happen upon a gray tree frog pretending to be invisible on a low broad leaf, having wandered away from the nearby woody area, perhaps in search of a stream. My ears might catch a gentle rustle followed by the tiny, reedy, dick thick sis 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 of a dick sisal foraging on the ground, or the more robust hooting and drumming of a male prairie chicken come according. I might walk past the cluster of bare sylphium stems in the brown gray of winter and marvel at how twisting some can be in stark descent from the straight lines of the surrounding grasses. Or I might stumble across something I've never seen before. I skipped over one, that's this one. <laughs> Such as an emerging horsetail in spring, low to the ground. This is from uh, Neil Smith. It's light tan tubercle covered cones appearing alien amid the more familiar greening stalks and stems. Or perhaps I might just close my eyes and open my ears, letting the whoosh and whistle of wind of birdsong of insect chorus perform its grassland cantata for me. Whatever the surprise, I let the prairie remind me that it and the whole natural world are full of wonders I have yet to experience. Sometimes they cross my path when I least expect it, or perhaps when my mind wanders to the cares of the world beyond this moment, drawing me back to the present in this place. I will experience more surprise with greater intention by checking my expectations, by changing my perspective, by paying attention. Look up, look down, look inward, open your eyes, open your ears, open all your senses, <coughs> open your heart, look closely, listen intently, Feel deeply. Let the prairie surprise you so you can see the world anew. This one is from the uh, Conard Research Center Prairie uh, near Grinnell. Uh, it's the, uh, the Grinnell College uh, Prairie. All right. Um, a little bit different, uh, a couple of essays. Um, this next one on, uh, on restoration itself, which obviously is something I think a lot of folks here are involved in, certainly interested in. Um, again, uh, back up a little bit in the way this book was put together. Each conversation has a, an essay on the same subject, one by Cindy, one by me. We each took the lead uh, uh, on different ones. So surprise was one of the concepts that we came up with. Uh, restoration is another. And the book is arranged around 26 of these, these kinds of concepts or ideas. Uh, and uh, we went uh, and went from there. Um, surprise was one of my lead ones. And uh, restoration, actually, Cindy took the lead on that. And this is, this is my contribution to restoration. Me. They look familiar. Anybody know where this is? You, yes, yes, here we are. Here's the shack, the, the famous <laughs> shack. Uh, I've had the good fortune of 
being there a few times and, and being at various programs there. And uh, this was in the, I think this is the first time I, this photo is the first time I was there uh, in, uh, I think it's in, in September. And I uh, did a program called the uh, Land Ethic Leaders there. It was one of the first uh, people to go through that, that program. And, um, and that's where this, this essay comes from. Uh, wonderful place to go. The Aldo Leopold Center uh, from the Aldo Leopold Foundation is nearby. Wonderful, beautiful place. It's certainly well worth the trip up toward, uh, up toward Baraboo. So here's uh, my restoration essay. I can't believe I'm standing in the middle of the world's second ecological restoration at the Leopold Shack near Baraboo, Wisconsin. And I can't believe I'm pulling out native plants from this historic ground. In 1935, Aldo Leopold, born and raised on the banks of the Mississippi in Burlington, Iowa, which I always mention, Leopold is an Iowan uh, in his origin. And, uh, Leopold and his family in 1935 began a historic effort on a worn out farm he had purchased along the Wisconsin River. The previous year, Aldo and his colleagues had spearheaded the first ecological restoration in the world the University of Wisconsin Arboretum in Madison, which includes the Curtis Prairie. Transporting this radical idea onto his nearby private land, Leopold and family lovingly turned the abandoned chicken coop into the now legendary shack and began replanting a mixed woods and prairie landscape devastated by ignorance. Today, the restored prairie at the shack thrives, but it must be managed. Leopold himself rarely used the word restoration, being more likely to say he was healing the wounded land. The healing of a human wound does not return the body precisely to its original state. Likewise, once disturbed, land cannot really be returned exactly to its previous condition. Opportunistic native plants, not just invasive species, can challenge prairie restoration. Goldenrod is native to the tall grass prairie, but also aggressive. Leave it alone and your diverse prairie could become colonized by significant stretches of tiny golden late summer flowers. This is what's happened to our little prairie patch in our backyard. <laughs> Part of my training as a land ethic leader through the Aldo Leopold Foundation included a service project. One of our tasks was to cull goldenrod from the prairie at the shack. So indeed, here I was, pulling native plants out of the second ecological restoration in the world. I was treading the same ground where Aldo and family had spent years planting, managing, and replanting in this historic prairie. Although my labor was brief and my efforts small in scope, as I tugged the colonizing stalks from the sandy Wisconsin soil, amazement at the historic continuum I found myself within flooded my awareness. My visits to the shack and the Leopold Center a half mile down the road have always been significant restorative events for me. Whether I'm participating in a writing workshop with Kim Blazer at the shack, attending the dedication of the new memorial at the site of Aldo's death with his daughter Estella sharing words with us, enjoying a Scott Russell Sanders reading or conference reception at the gorgeous center building, or just sauntering along the woodland path to the Leopold Great Marsh. My spirit and my faith in the land ethic are always restored. But I have yet to quite replicate the restorative inspiration of standing amidst the swaying grasses and forbs of the prairie at the shack on a beautiful breezy September day, placing my hand to the soil worked by Aldo Leopold himself and contributing a few moments to the healing of this very special wounded land the great conservationist had envisioned and practiced so many decades ago. Uh, kind of a companion piece is a remnant. Um, I'm gonna find it here. Uh, this is at the, uh, in the Les Hills, this is the, at the Hitchcock Nature Center um, uh, in, in the western edge of Iowa. And this is remnants. I am a collector of remnants. 
In Remnants, I find reality and authenticity. Among my prized possessions are a discarded roofing shingle from Sigurd Olson's Listening Point Cabin and a bundle of red pine bark shavings I debarked as part of a land ethic leader service project from a Leopold tree, a tree that all the Leopold family members had planted decades ago on the land at the shack in Wisconsin. We had two activities. One was <laughs> calling the goldenrod. The other one was debarking uh, red pines. Um, red pine wasn't the best tree to plant in this land. Uh, all the Leopold, you know, uh, a lot of it was trial and error, and they planted too many of them. They planted something like 40,000 trees, he and his family over the time. And, and now, of course, many are maturing, so they're actually having to very carefully uh, cull a lot of those Leopold trees, and they're doing various things with them. A lot of the Leopold Foundation Center was built uh, from, from the wood of these Leopold trees. So. And when we were debarking them, I was the same kind of thing as with the uh, uh, goldenrod. It's like, I'm debarking um, trees that Leopold and his family planted. And so I said, I got to take some pieces of this bark home with me, which I did. When the gold-topped dome of the University of Iowa's 1840 Old Capitol, the first state capitol building, burned in a construction accident, the next day I scoured the ash-laden grounds for a few charred remnants, which now sit on my office desk in the building next door. Sigurd Olson's Listening Point cabin has a new roof. Many Leopold trees have been repurposed into a beautiful green Leopold Foundation building. The UI's old capital has a shiny rebuilt dome sitting proudly atop the historic building. While all these projects had preservation at their heart, loss, loss in part of authenticity and reality has been inevitable. Such irretrievable loss is why I am compelled to gather remnants, to hold authenticity. Remnants are a stay against loss. I truly love to enter the grandeur of endless tall grass at Iowa's Neil Smith Wildlife Refuge, one of the largest prairie restorations in the country, or any number of smaller reconstructed prairies. But the most authentic prairie experience possible is not in restorations which by definition have lost their direct lineage to a continuous ecosystem, but in remnants, where native plants are the discarded original elders of the tall grass. Ironically, remnants are usually where human intervention is flagrant, if not pervasive. Hillsides among farm fields, and of course this is what, this is, this is a, in the, in the less hills, reason we have prairie remnants in a lot of theirs because they were hard to farm, and so uh, folks left them alone from, uh, from cultivation. Uh, other places, cemeteries, ditches along rail beds and roads, prairie remnants often exist because they are worthless, quote unquote. Pieces of native land on the margins that cannot be turned to utility or profit. My other photo here is from um, Rochester Cemetery, uh, which is near Iowa City, about 10, 20 miles from Iowa City, uh, which uh, has, uh, Pioneer Cemetery has, has uh, maintained its native, uh, a lot of its native landscape in there. Fortunately, some prairie stewards choose to care for these indigenous authentics, the most real quote-unquote, of the 0.1% of prairie acreage that remains in Iowa. Far to the west of my home in Iowa City, I can feel, smell, and touch the original prairie on Hitchcock Nature Center's Badger Ridge in the Les Hills, above the farm fields that spread out below me. A few miles to the east of my home, I can walk among Rochester Cemetery's truly native spiderwort and columbine that embrace the stone monuments on the graves of the fallen. Of course, I control my fingers that itch to acquire the authentic, to take with me a totem of the original tall grass. That's a no-no, so I have to restrain myself. I leave the ancient bee balm and milkweed pods behind so as not to break the primeval cycles still emerging from these small places. On the prairie, the remnant is original renewal, not inventive replication. It is the remains of the real in a world of artifice. All right. Um, 
I'm being aware of the time. I, I put in more than I had time for here, so I'll be skipping over uh, some of these, and I was aware of that. Um, as I said, um, there's a few poems in here, and since it's winter, I talked a little bit about winter and surprise, I thought maybe I'd have a little bit of uh, uh, honoring winter. And actually, one of the greatest surprises and delights for me in, in doing this book was um, going out on the prairie in the winter, which I had not done much of. Of course, we were looking for photographs from all of the seasons, and so I was kind of forced into it. And, and I loved it. And, you know, the, the winter prairie is, is astonishing and amazing. So um, I, was, I was very happy to have been forced, quote unquote, into doing that. This is a short little poem um, called Design. This is, um, this is from the Hoover Prairie again, I think, too. On the winter prairie, design remains. Color fades, seed drops, petal withers, leaf unmoors. But blue stems stalk still bends. Blazing stars scaffold still stands. Silphium's architecture still holds. Oak's arms still reach skyward, all in winter's still song. On the winter prairie, shadows play, fears fall, the path clarifies, purpose stands, design remains. Um, let me do another uh, winter one. This one's called Depth. And uh, both of these, I believe, again, are from the, the photos are from the Hoover. Prairie. This um, is an essay that kind of ties more into some of my other interests and abilities. Uh, this is about storytelling and stories. I come from a literary background, as Laura mentioned. Um, I uh, also have a bit of a musical background. I got a, a uh, undergraduate degree in music as well, and I have a couple of essays that, that try to incorporate music. I've got one here, but I think I'm going to have to skip it uh, with time. But, uh, but this one, since it's winter, I'll share it with you. It's called Depth. Winter is the foundation of the prairie story, its annual journey around the sun. While not the show, showiest, the time of dark and cold tells perhaps the most essential chapter of all the seasons. A good story brings us into an experience. Before we are brought out of it wiser and changed, we encounter intensity, conflict, sometimes danger, and if the story is worthy, beauty. Of all the seasons, we journey into and out of winter most consciously and intentionally. I am most fulfilled when I feel all the, all the dimensions of this story deeply. The more cold and snow, the more we know we are in deep, unmistakably in a place and time that does not resemble where we entered or where we will exit. In the prairie story, winter is a quiet time when dormancy reigns. Prairie dock leaves brown, shrink, and sag. The blue stem remains tall but it yellows and turns brittle as its quickening fades. Wild indigo's pods dry and hollow out. As the wind sweeps over the grassland, the sounds of swaying grasses and disturbed husks and hulls are subtle and crisp. No birds sing to the percussive ostinato. Yet on the winter prairie, life gathers its force to emerge and then explode in vernal epitasis. As the deep snow smothers the past year's growth, its moist blanket broods over the next year's life patiently rejuvenating below in the rich, deep, and dark soil. In winter, we are much like the prairie's subterra and superterra. We slacken and perhaps droop, but in our rest, we are recharging our elan vital, our vital force. The more in deep we are, the more our own life stories lengthen their roots, the more vibrant is our emergence in spring. Nature's fury may overwhelm us with a monumental blizzard, ice storm, or sub-zero arctic blast. 
These are the narrative twists and turns that a good story spawns. When we reach the end of such a tale, even a harrowing one, our protagonist is wiser and perhaps triumphant, as are we. A good winter should make us feel the same way come April. But winter gifts us not only with harshness and trials. On the prairie, if we cannot perceive the gorgeousness of a resilient compass plant stalk standing lonely sentry in the quietness of a heavy snowfall, or the stark exquisiteness of bare oak branches rising from a savanna against a steel gray sky, or the awesome misty breath of a harsh wind blowing over a fallow sea of Indian grass, then our aesthetic palette needs revitalizing from a good winter's tale. Winter on the Prairie is a beautiful and frightening story. We will emerge at the denouement, perhaps blinking our eyes after the darkness or raising our arms toward the sun's warmth as we wander the green up and delight at the first pasque flower. But to get there, we and the prairie must first be in deep, letting the tale grow on its own terms, in its own time, and within its own beauty. All right, I think I'll do one more. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple here. This is a, one called Direction. These are, it's, it focuses on compass plants. This is at the Conard uh, uh, Prairie. And, um, and Joy uh, is, is one that brings in uh, more music. And I'm, I'm comparing the uh, flight and song of the goldfinch to opera in here. And <laughs> here's a goldfinch on the Hoover Prairie. But the last one uh, I want to share with you then today is Majesty. Uh, the first photo, this is from the Hoover Prairie again, and the second photo you will see is from uh, Neil Smith. Majesty. Here in the Midwest, many often apologize for our landscape. We don't, have any, we don't have any mountains or oceans, but the American default majestic landscape does not include grasslands. Oh sure, in the lyrics to America the Beautiful, amber waves of grain do get a call out, but the purple mountains get the majesties. Even Merriam-Webster, which defines majesty as, quote, greatness or splendor of quality or character, gives as an example the majesty of the mountains. But what majesty the prairie holds? We associate majesty with splendor, with grandeur, with magnificence. The Middle English sense of majesty raises the stakes from Latin's magus, meaning major, to invoking, invoking in fact the greatness of God. Surely that is not the province of only oceans and mountains is not an endless green and yellow horizon with unreachable elevations of swelling cumulus clouds amassed above it, full of anything but grandeur? <clears throat> Are not miles of countless big blue stem turkey foot spikes mingled across the seasons with shades of purple spiderwort, red little blue stem and ivory rattlesnake master anything but splendorous? Is not a herd of bison or a lone sentinel Standing proudly on a grassland rise, massive heads in regal contemplation, anything but magnificent? I know, though, that today's prairie is broken majesty. The broad horizons I enjoy at the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge or the Hoover Prairie here in Iowa are measured in acres rather than miles. The restored prairie raised from disturbed ground has different proportions of abundance in its grasses and forbs compared to the true native remnant. Very few of the bison remaining in the wild and virtually none in, in captivity are free of cattle DNA. Yet I still fully embrace the prairie's broken majesty. I think of Sparky, the popular bison at Neil Smith Wildlife Refuge who died this past week as I write. Sparky got his name and popularity from being struck by lightning in 2013, 
nearly five years before his death. A refuge biologist, the same one who found him dead, discovered the burned and bloodied bison not long after the storm had passed. The folks at Neil Smith were surprised he survived, but visitors to the refuge were always delighted to see the aging bull with the burn scars on his hump lumber past their car on the road. Although Sparky's original majesty was broken, his endurance manifested a different kind of grandeur and inspired awe in all who saw or even just knew of him. Sparky was always majestic and in many ways grew more so. If majesty is the greatness of what is beyond our full human comprehension, then it is always unfolding to our senses and understanding. Even when the majesty of the world is broken by human hands, as has been the case for oceans and mountains, as well as prairies, nature will find a new path to proclaim its glory. Even when human hands seek to heal the wounds we have laid upon this earth, the splendor that follows is nature's, not our declamation. Prairie's majesty is always its own. Okay, well that's a little sampling of uh, what we have in the book. I want to, again, just want to make sure that we thank uh, Tallgrass Prairie Center for uh, uh, being a sponsor of the book. Uh, the um, Center for Prairie Studies at Grinnell and um, uh, the Friends of Neil Smith Wildlife Refuge and the Nature Conservancy of Illinois were also our sponsors. And uh, what that means is that these organizations, again, including Tallgrass Prairie Center, helped us with some uh, uh, funding. Because in order to put a book like this together, of color photographs on nice paper, especially with a small press uh, like Ice Cube, um, uh, takes more than the press is able to uh, provide up front themselves. So a subvention of sorts is necessary. So Cindy and I were out doing a little fundraising, and we were very, very happy that the center here uh, stepped forward and said, yes, we'll, we'll help out with the book. So. Um, so I guess we have a little time for questions or comments. And, Curious, where is yeah. Ice Cube Press located? Uh, North Liberty, in uh, basically Iowa City area. So uh, yeah, he um, does several books uh, a year that focus uh, on the, the Midwest and living in the Midwest. And in fact, one of his new books, there's a reading of Prairie Lights tonight. He's uh, come out with a book um, on uh, uh, Ignacio Pancetti. Uh, actually, who was a doctor at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics who um, created a, a, uh, a treatment for clubfoot that did not involve surgery. It was basically a little bit with braces, a little bit of manipulation, and so he's very well known. And so, so he's got a lot of different kinds of uh, approaches, but they're all kind of rooted in one way or another in the, in the Midwest. Any other questions or? Comments and happy to entertain. Brick bats as well. Say so you're crazy. <laughs> this, this is marvelous. Thank you. Um, one of the things we've been hearing about in town, and we've had some speakers at, at Prairie Rapids Ottoman Society, for example, is about also the physical benefits of being outside with nature, and even at the um, you know internal microbial level, things like forest bathing, which you could do just as well in a prairie as a mm -hmm. forest. Mm -hmm. and the, the kind of uh, physical health benefits in addition to psychological health. So it might be something to explore. Yeah, yeah. And that is, and even, um, uh, and even where I think the physical and, and psychological meet, for example, feelings of, uh, of happiness, I think, are, are often been measured to have been able to be uh, uh, noted as, as rising relatively quickly, you know, out in nature. And of course, that has, has both psychological as well as, as physical <laughs> benefits. Yeah, yeah, it's really an area that's really coming to the fore. Richard Louv is somebody who's, you know, written a, a lot about that. And I uh, um. appreciate you bringing your feelings out about the mm. prairie. Those are sometimes harder to feel, to bring out. I think if you've got talent to do that, so that's great. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, and that's one of the things we want to encourage too. I think it's you know it's obviously important and essential that um, you know we we be good stewards of uh, of the land, whether it's prairie or whatever the case may be, in a 
uh, in the correct way and in, <laughs> and in a scientifically sound way and so forth. But especially when we're talking about this, this conversation, and that's one of the things that Belton Lane will often talk about is that, um, uh, but, but we also need those kinds of emotional connections, emotional reactions, emotional connections, uh, as well as aesthetic and uh, whatever, whatever our uh, relationship, uh, however it operates, you know, we need to, we need to be, be sensitive to that too. Well, mm -hmm. if there's no further questions, I'm sure there's there's time for more conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's uh, thank Thomas Dean for his. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.